Hello and welcome to the Scottish Football Show. Coming up, Clement wraps up a Christmas cup. Derek Adams is on the naughty list. And is there trouble brewing in paradise? There certainly was for Santa. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Let's move on. Uh, yeah, it's Christmas time. Welcome to the Scottish Football Show. It's going to be a fun one because I've been out the night. Yes. Full of double deckers, caramel wafers and pints. Let's go for it, guys. Um, <laughs> yeah, what a weekend in Scottish football it has been. We've got Laura Brannan from TNT Sports, my sister from another mister. Hello. And Hello. You all right, pal? I'm all good. I'm good. I'm good, too. I'm flying. Absolutely fleeing. And uh, someone who is flying over sometime next year, Finlay Marks, the head of creative, uh, the Baldy Maestro, that is Finlay Marks. Hello, pal. You joining us in uh, Germany? Uh, that is very much the plan. I would love to. We've we've got booked nothing else, but we do have our flights booked at least to Glasgow um, about three days before the Euro starts. So everything else is kind of fair game from there. At least at least I'm slightly closer in Glasgow than I will be in Melbourne. So. <laughs> Given them, um, I, I should really start. Like this is an absolute mad period for all of us. Um, like when you see when you work in sport, but particularly football at Christmas time. It is utterly non-stop. So, I mean, I, I can happily jump into what I'm doing at the moment, but Laura, how are things at TNT right now? Spill the beans. Well, normally um, I've always had a really busy Christmas working in football. I've actually got a wee bit lucky this year because TNT don't have a Boxing Day game. So it's oh, a TNT little are bit crowded. So, so yeah, Amazon <laughs> have picked up the, the, the Boxing Day game, which is very nice of Amazon to do that because it means that TNT's You're last game is the week before Christmas and the week after Christmas. So I actually get a wee bit of time off in between to go home. But normally, oh. uh, working in club football, as Finn probably alludes to right now, it is utter chaos and uh, you're lucky if you even get christmas day off because the players don't so when the media team are lucky enough to do it then you, you grab that with both hands yeah it's um it's pretty chaotic Th thankfully we do get christmas day off um but uh, yeah all the this build-up uh, goes to the melbourne derby is always the saturday closest to christmas which happens to be the 23rd this year so quite late oh wow um which is by far Melbourne City's biggest game of the season because uh, not just in terms of on the pitch, but off the pitch as well, where um, the average gate, I would say, at most Melbourne City games is about 3,000 probably. For the Derby, it will be closer to 10 times that. So um, in terms of the revenue that that generates and, and everything else, but obviously on the pitch, it's a massive game because it's a Derby. So um, yeah, I get uh, a couple of days off either side of the game sandwiched in between, I think it's the 28th of December. But yeah, so the first time I've had to work Christmas is at a football club, but yeah, it's busy, it's non-stop, non-stop. This, this is what you get on the Scottish football show. You get someone <laughs> who's working on the English Premier League, but they don't have the game on Boxing Day and you have Australian football knowledge. Welcome to... <laughs> and, I, and yeah, I'm also working on the English Premier League. So this is why but, you should listen but... to the show, Laura. This is why the listeners enjoy it, I hope, is because even though we're doing all of that, we will always take the time out of our day to talk about the thing that we love the most, and that is Scottish football. Da -da 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 That's the thing. I get a time off now to go home, and I get to go to the Scottish games, and that's the difference. To be fair, there was an amazing shot of you. I don't know where it was, but it was definitely a Champions League game, and I think you were wearing headphones. And... Uh, <laughs> And your good pal Grant definitely put on Instagram saying she is 100% listening to Sports Sound right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a Prem game. I was kick at, off or no, no, I was at um, Real Madrid versus Bragg on the Champions League and I was listening to St Mirren versus Hibs on the Amazing. radio. Amazing. God bless Get you, one. Laura. The bastion <laughs> of Scottish football. Right, well, let's continue the laughs. We should really start only in one place considering it's a festive podcast. Um, why on earth was Santa being booed? This is well, the it's a good question. We <laughs> can start. I'm going to just open up my um, my Tunnix Caramel Wafer. If you enjoy Tunnix Caramel Wafers, I'm eating one right now. 
and we are not sponsored by them yet. But we should be. Um, yeah, Santa getting booed off the pitch at Celtic Park is one of the best Scottish football stories in recent weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I love this so much. So yeah, Celtic obviously 2-0 down to Hearts at half time in the league at the weekend and the Celtic fans were having absolutely none of anything that was going on <laughs> around the stadium. So when Santa comes out at half time to do, I assume the draw, um, the, the prize draw, <laughs> just met by a rendition of booze around the ground and then you get these photos of him afterwards did you see after he's walking off pulls his hat his hair off he's he's got his (laughs) wig pulled off he's walking off just completely dejected by the the reaction he got (laughs) he was just that poor man was in the wrong place at the wrong time aye but he's no he's no the real santa He's just what? representing so Santa. No, what? He's, he's, just, no, he's, 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 he's just representing Santa while he's uh, away doing his job. Ah, he's no Santa's uh, well, helper, okay, so why is he getting so upset yeah. about it? <laughs> <laughs> because we all take our jobs very seriously, Andrew, okay? And this is important to him. I just like... He's for those only of got you one that job. <laughs> for those of you that I haven't it actually sounds so heard Roy this, Keen about it. I was... I was um, because obviously I read about it, or, you know, on Twitter or whatever, be blah, 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 Santa getting booed. And, you know, you kind of chuckle and you're just like, oh, I'm sure it was just like, you know, the old person here or there. I, then I, somebody sent me the video and it's like the whole ground is booed. <laughs> he gets announced over the, the speaker system and yeah. And then he just gets this massive bit. I felt so sorry for the guy. Oh man, that's just devastating. One thing I, I really enjoyed, um, uh, trawling through social media was um the the did you do you see the Frankfurt fans that weren't allowed into uh Pitodri for the Europa Conference League game with Aberdeen but they still travelled and they uh they headed up into like a like the top of a hill and were were singing the whole game did you see I mean, that was it's so cool wasn't it so cool incredible they must have been absolutely Baltic because Aberdeen <laughs> is not the warmest place in December to start with, but then you stand on top of a hill completely exposed. That is going to be That warm, hill is chilly. right next to the North Sea as well. It is the only thing Why? splitting Pataudry and the North Sea is that hill. So fair yeah. play to them. <laughs> Pretty cool though. I really like I, I quite liked as well. I don't know if you saw the, the um the, they were checking that none of the Frankfurt fans were, were going in through the Aberdeen turnstiles at the game. And the security was, it was incredibly scientific. Their strategy was basically going up to people and saying, how are you doing? Um, presumably they were going up, well, presumably <laughs> they were going up saying, it's like, and seeing if they got a, a proper answer or a bemused one. But um, apparently in the queue, <laughs> there was one guy in a very thick Doric accent that just said, ah, oh, good, danke. So uh, yeah, just to play up Very to the to, to that bit of banter, but yeah, a fair play to the fans, man. It's such a shame they didn't get allowed in because they are a brilliant support. Um, Do we remember why why supporters. they couldn't get in? Was it some sort of UEFA trouble? sanctions that were around it? Obviously, they probably I don't know kicked off a match eight seconds too late and got a, a <laughs> stadium closure or something, knowing UEFA. But yeah, it'll be something to do with that. What else have you got for me, Laura? Did you see the Willie column was? Um bootless well one bootless for his uh <laughs> european match that he was doing during the week um, i don't know what game it was he was refereeing but i just saw the clip of him carrying his boot in his hand as he was running along the pitch which kind of just feels like a really good metaphor for willie Collum in general <laughs> bootless footless <laughs> It was well, well what it's not just that his shoe came off. It's like his shoe had come off and he was trying to catch up back to the action. <laughs> so he's picked up his boot and he's sprinting back across the field with one shoe on <laughs> and one in his hand, trying to get up. Yeah, it, it, a truer metaphor for a Scottish referee, I don't think's ever been there. Okay, so after Laura's big old rant about Motherwell and how poorly run they are last week. <laughs> Laura, can, harsh, you okay. what's, can you tell me what's just happened at the well? Yeah, so there was um, news broke that Chairman Jim McMahon and interim part-time CEO Derek Weir is going to step down from Motherwell next year. So Chairman and CEO are 
clearing out. Uh, it comes after a well clearing society <laughs> board <laughs> comes after a well society board meeting, um, where the pair have decided it's time for a new direction at Far Park. So Jim McMahon is going to stay until the end of the season, I think. Derek Weir until I think it's the end of March. So yeah, a few more months, and then there's things that are going to be changing. Um, looks like they're going to have to obviously look for, well, new chairman, new CEO. Um, yeah, things are changing but- at Far Park. Yeah, but in your opinion, do you think that this could instigate something positive for the club, or do you think it's something that even puts them further into turmoil? No, I think going off like what I was kind of explaining last week in terms of just how it's run just now, this, as I was kind of alluding to in last week's episode, the CEO's only in three times a week. Um, there needs to be more done at a higher level. It's not just let's just blame the manager and the players for the bad results. I think this is a good thing that's happening. Look, Jim McMahon leaves and will be very well remembered once he's left for a park. He was um, a big part to play in terms of the, the club becoming fan-owned and has done a lot of good things for the club. But I think it's right that they, they can look for a, a new approach and a new direction going forward. So it looks like the, but that, the Wilson but that side... approach. That approach in your direction seems like it, it's not there right now. It feels like well, th- this is the start of it. And it's like, that well, is clearly you exactly want that not. before all of this happens. That's that's, well, that's the, the fear, right? Like we're, we're talking about it. it like crowds aren't on the rise. Player trading hasn't really progressed. There's We don't see as much of the community work that's done, which I know is done. It's just not shouted about as much now. Um, It feels like the things that Motherwell used to stand out for aren't really there for people to see anymore. So the the right now it doesn't feel it was a plan to take this club forward um and really give them that strong foundation of the future. No. But I feel like this change could give them that. That you've got the Well Society board now who are the majority shareholders, the fans who own the club. There's there's nine people on the board there. Um and they will work with the, the people left on the board as well to to find people that, that were going to move us in the right direction going forward and I think what's good about that is that the Well Society are quite young and forward thinking um, they're not your stuffy board in terms of all your middle aged to old elderly white men that have all kind of got the same mentality in football which you do find quite often across the board in football especially in Scottish football um, I think going to the fans to get decisions moving forward could open up new ideas fresh ideas um and bring something different to the board moving forward um i presume both of you are against b teams and have you seen that the lone league have voted to keep b teams into well in their division for at least the next two seasons it's going to be celtic and hearts b teams that that continue 15 teams voted uh, six of them came out to publicly say they didn't want it um, so it was kind of almost a split vote, it, vote was 8 for and 7 against um, and one club didn't vote who was the club that didn't vote? It's not been confirmed There has um, there's one club that's been who spoken about on social media <laughs> but we, we cannot say because we do not know <laughs> yeah, it's, allegedly, it's allegedly Gretna but I have no facts to back that up Retina. <laughs> <laughs> That's just hearsay on social media. I'm not saying that factually. <laughs> wow, my, the power that Gretna must have. That's tremendous. But it's, you know, it's an it's it is an interesting one because I think it, it, I, I, <clears throat> I find it really interesting that the, the vote was so close and it is literally pretty much a 50-50 split. So there are obviously some very strong feelings either way. Um I think the clubs that very strongly feel that that B teams or academy teams shouldn't be part of the league system have been very vocal about it and and they're well within the rights to do that. I think some of the clubs that maybe feel maybe in their own interest it's better to have B teams in the league, yeah. maybe because of the money or the exposure or whatever, um, but they don't feel brave enough to kind of stand out and be like, actually, we think it's a positive thing for the game. So I, I don't know, all you can do is be democratic about it and get the clubs to vote. They voted this way, so you kind of have to go with it. Um, at a personal level, I'm kind of disappointed by it because I think the B team experiment in the lone leagues been 
not a great one, not a hugely positive <laughs> one. He had something. Was was it thirty three year old James McCarthy played was playing for the Celtic beat it? You're like, well, what's the point? What's the point? Yeah. Um, and it just kind of it cheapens the league a little bit. And as we've seen with the teams coming up from the Lowland League and Highland League into the into the the league system, there are brilliant teams there who are oven ready if you want to use the brag brexit metaphor oh my for coming into the league system and 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 <laughs> uh and surviving and doing really well you know we've seen kelty hearts and the spartans and teams like that coming up so um yeah i, I on a personal level i was a bit gutted but you have to let these clubs govern themselves absolutely um some positive news or maybe negative if you're a forfer fan um that there's some international superstars down in the lower leagues of Scottish football, because uh, Forfers, Roberto Nditi, I hope I'm saying that right, he's going to miss the start of the new year because he's off to Kenya uh, to represent uh, Tanzania in the African Cup of Nations. Tournament starts uh, on the 13th of January. I always loved the African Cup of Nations, um, and I will pay particular attention to Roberto going forward. That's exciting. But um, there was some kind of, not great news at the weekend, not in Scottish football, but elsewhere. And it's kind of stokes a few fires as to what has happened in Scotland in the past. So we're going to hear about that now. Big men are up from the back. El Mahani, right foot. Oh, jeez, he peeps, man. This uh, next segment is kind of born out of something that's not really a Scottish football story, but something that's quite close to the game up here. Down in England, we saw Luton Town defender Tom Lockyer, who suffered a heart attack on the pitch at the weekend with the game being abandoned. It was the second time that this has actually happened to Tom after a similar incident in the playoffs at the end of the season, last season that is. So we wanted to look into what's really being done in our game uh, to help, or the, the overall game, to help spot and prevent these issues. So I'm really pleased to say we're actually joined by a genuine doctor, <laughs> which is great. Um, Hearts Club doctor, that is, Dr. Michael Campbell. Thanks so much for giving us your time. Michael, it's it's really good to kind of get to the way, get to the heart of it, of matters. I'm sorry for <laughs> the old pun. That's ah, terrible, isn't it? We've even got that. It's the fact that it's the Hearts Club doctor as well. I'll stop the jokes now, because this is no laughing matter. Uh, but Tell me what's being done in our game to help spot and prevent these sorts of things um, at the moment, because this is this is kind of important. Now, we look back at 16 years ago mm -hmm. when we, we saw, you know, legend that is Phil O'Donnell who passed away on the pitch as well. Yes, I think that's why it's, you know, it's always going to be um, very close to um, the Scottish game after that incident, which everyone remembers. And, and that certainly um, led to kind of intensification of, you know, things were already in motion, but certainly in the last uh, you know, 15 years, it'll be, you know, things have uh, have moved on um, a lot in terms of, of what we do. Um, so, um, you know, thankfully, these things are rare. Um, so it's roughly kind of one in 40 to one in 80,000, depending on what gets quoted as to how often, you know, there's a, a sudden cardiac death. Um, and thankfully, some of these incidents don't end in deaths. And that's, Thankfully, quite a lot of them don't end in deaths, and that's uh, becoming more and more the case thanks to what does happen. Um, in terms of Scottish football, um, I can certainly speak for what we do at, at Hearts. So um, what we do is a kind of baseline screening with all of our um, full-time professional players um, where you take a, um, a history, where you check for um, cardiac symptoms such as kind of chest pain, lightheadedness, um, palpitations, so feeling like your heart's racing, um, and shortness of breath. Um, another very important thing would be family history, um, which can um, give quite a, um, a, a can be quite a, a predictor of um, cardiac risk. Um, each player in Scottish football, um, in the Scottish professional leagues, so the Scottish Premiership down to League Two, um, through their career, they'll have one SFA funded. Um, cardiac screen, um, so that's an um, an ECG, um, an echocardiogram, um, uh, um, which are two different tests. One looking at the electrical activity of the heart, um, and having a look at kind of cardiac rhythm uh, with with a 
uh, player as it happens to be at rest. And then the echocardiogram, which is the kind of cold jelly scan through the chest wall, looking at the um, structure and the flow of blood through the heart in real time. Um, and when you put these two together, you get a, a nice picture of the kind of wiring and structure of the heart. Um, and that can pick up things like um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which um, uh, you know is often cited as the cause of uh, of many of these cardiac arrest episodes. Um, so that's a wee bit of the background of what we do. Um, now we pick up, you know, we 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 certainly do pick things up from that, um, you know, and all of these things I should add are all kind of. No, they're not looked at by people like myself. I'm not a, um, I'm not a cardiologist. Never mind a, um, a cardiologist who specialises in sport and young athletes. Um, so they all go to um, a cardiologist who's attached through um, with the SFA and I think has been for many years. Um, who looks at all of the results coming through. Um, and uses this kind of wealth of experience to to be able to pick things up and often um with with the clubs, like I say, it happens with with all the professional clubs. It's once in their, um, at least once in their career. But as you move up, up certainly, um, it, it's something that you know for UEFA clubs, clubs going to compete in UEFA competition, it's uh, a case of, um, you get an ECG every year. So that's the one with the twelve leads across your chest, um, and then the echo, um, which is the one that looks at the structure and the flow, um, you get that every two years um, at clubs competing in European competition. What's the procedure then, Michael, if you do spot an irregularity? Because um, mm -hmm. I think this happened with Connor Goldson, didn't it? Um, something quite innocent was spotted. Uh, sorry, something was spotted in quite an innocent test and then he mm -hmm. got it solved quite straightforwardly. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened and he was then 24, like Laura. He was 24 as well, I think, which is obviously a long time after these sort of things would be would be being checked so it's mm -hmm. quite a later these things can these things can change michael mm -hmm. yeah no absolutely and you know that is one thing of being a, a you know a footballer at a higher level you, you will tend to get these things checked um you know on a on an annual basis so every club i've worked for um which includes um you know a club in the scottish championship and um uh, Two different clubs uh, up in the Scottish Premiership um, have done this. Have done an ECG with all of their first team players every year, um, and the echo scan every two years. So, the more information they get, and over time, you know, certainly um, normal results over that time gives you, you know, further reassurance than just a one-off normal. Um, although that is the biggest reassurance in the first instance. Um, in terms of abnormalities getting picked up they, they they do um you know athletes hearts are different than um people who are less athletic they're, they're putting their heart through more strain their heart muscles tend to be a bit bigger um so um you know it's not unusual for things to be picked um to be picked up it's I'd say not unusual it's uncommon however it's it's there it happens um and i'd imagine there's a collection of players each year that have to go through um you know potentially more stringent tests or they might need to have a face-to-face -face with a, um, a sports cardiologist, for example. Um, some of the further tests can be like a, a cardiac MRI, um, um, which looks at the heart in a different way again. Um, sometimes it can be an um, exercise stress test where um, they'll have um, the heart monitored as they are working up through exercise and as they increase their heart rate over a certain level. I just wanted to pick up on something that you mentioned there, Michael, about about the fact that you know football players or elite athletes might they, they do have bigger muscles, they they do put their body under such immense strain. And at the elite end of the game, I think, you know, the incidents that always come to mind with this, specifically, I think for us as Scottish football fans, Phil O'Donnell is the most shocking. But these are not uncommon sights, uh, tragically. You know, we can all remember like Fabrice Moamba, Christian Eriksen at, at the Euros. Mm -hmm. These things happen. Um, and I, I mean, they rarely, given the amount of football that's played around the world, but they're still shocking when they do happen. In your professional opinion, do you think the demands on players, maybe in general, but certainly towards the elite end of the game, are too much? Like, are, are human bodies designed for this amount of physical strain? 
I mean, certainly, I think there's um, you know, that's that's obviously been uh, discussed a lot in regards to kind of musculoskeletal injuries and uh, particularly kind of muscle injuries. Um, and, and how often they're happening. Um, I know it's a big feature again down south um, this year, where the you know the games are extended further with the you know the kind of more attention to to, to time wasting etc. Um, and you know I know the the clubs there are are not necessarily happy about it. Um, in terms of you know cardiac um, strain and cardiac risk with that, from what I've not seen anything that. I've not I've not read anything that's kind of looked into that in detail. And thankfully, you know, in some ways, because these things are so rare, um, you know, it's harder to get, you know, you know, that accurate detail from that. Um, you know, where um, you know, you can you can do huge analysis of hamstring injuries because you know there's there's six a six a squad all the time, you know, versus yeah. um um uh, versus you know these, which are thankfully very rare incidents. Um, I mean, certainly these uh, episodes that you highlighted, um, I think Mark Vivian Foe was one who unfortunately yeah. died on the pitch. Um, and I think since then there's there's been this kind of sea change in, in you know, structure and, and organisation and knowledge and, and just kind of professionalism around football in terms of how these things are approached. Um, and thankfully with that, you know, there's a, you know, a, a marked... Um, you know, uh, change and kind of positive outcome with these things. Um, you know, as much as uh, it's uh, you know, these these sort of incidents always bring it to everyone's attention, and they're they're always shocking and upsetting for those involved, be them teammates or even you know, I'm sure on sa Saturday's case, you know, the fans watching on. Um, but thankfully, um, most of these. Um, cases of sudden um, cardiac arrest, um, you know, can can be uh, promptly treated with, um, uh, you know, with with, with getting shocks, um, with getting um, shocked by a, a defibrillator, um, and that is, um, you know, that I would say, despite all this screening that we do, um, where you know we do pick up some things that put you at higher risk, these things can still happen, um, so that's where. You know, staff training at football clubs is is probably the biggest factor in how we change how how outcomes are with this. Um, I can speak again for Hearts. Um, you know, we we ensure that every training session that happens, um, certainly for our first team and B team, which are our two kind of full professional teams, um, you know, there is a um a, a, a clinician, either a physiotherapist or a doctor. At each training session, um, you know, before a ball's kicked until the end, until the last player leaves the pitch, um, and I think what is common to just about every club in the league, they'll have, um, you know, all of the equipment there on site, ready to go, um, in terms of the defibrillator, um, and other kind of emergency life saving equipment, um, and there really is, you know, you know, more so than if some if it happened to somebody on. Sucky Hall Street, um, you know, athletes are more likely to survive because um, the type of cardiac arrest they have is more likely to be one that is, you know, rescued, is helped by a, um, by a defibrillator. Rangers win the League Cup! James Tavernier's the hero! As he's so often is in the blue and white! Well, folks, what a week it has been for Rangers. Title race is alive and kicking. They've made the last 16 of Europa League. And, of course, they've lifted the first silverware of the season. Wow, Finn. Give it, like, what, three months, two months ago, Michael Beale, the, the, the blagger, blagger Beale, is uh, is off. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Philip Clement has come in, changed everything but has he changed like how much has he changed is it just a professional mindset or is it just kind of you know making training fun again he's he seems like obviously people will allude to the fact that Celtic have just lost two league matches in a row which changes the whole dynamic of the league situation but there is a real dynamic shift uh within the Rangers kind of camp right now I think the difference that Clement's made has been night and day from 
Excellent. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think under Beale Rangers looked at this is around about September time. They looked disparate, confused, a bit directionless. There was no real strategy on the pitch. Clement's come in and very quickly, I think, streamlined the the message to the players. He's gotten players to do very specific roles, which they've alluded to. So I think John Lundstrom looks like a, a player that knows what he's doing now, whereas he didn't before. Uh, Tavernier even, I think, is better now in the last nine weeks or so that Clement's been in than he was towards the start of the season. Um, I, I think he's made some quite big changes. So one of the big ones is he's um, when he came in, and I think he was shocked by this. It shouldn't really happen at a, a, a big club. There was basically just one training schedule for the entire squad. There were no personalised programmes. And I don't know if that's been part of the reason why there's been so many injuries, but um, there are specialised programmes now. They're detailing things per player, not for the squad. Um, Rangers have also brought in Tom Taylor from Brighton as the head of performance, um, as well as they're bringing in Nils Coppin from PSV as director of football recruitment in January. Um, I, I think the most underlying thing was, and just looking to the, to the cup final for a second, uh, or over the past week, Rangers through their injuries have had to bring in um, Dujon Sterling uh, to play defensive midfield. So this is a player whose natural position is right back and play centre back at a push, but he's never played defensive mid in his life. And he had to do it in Betis uh, for parts of the game. He had to cover for Cifuentes when he got sent off in the league game. And then he played the full game against Aberdeen and he was man of the match. And I think that's the difference to me of what a coach can do and I'm a proper coach, like an elite level manager coach like Clement and what Bill couldn't do because those players regressed under him and players that are, I think, limited sometimes have mm -hmm. shown that they can give more under Clement. So at uh, Dessers as well with his goal against Betis, I know that Clement spent time with him on the plane, showing him videos and it special using that time to be like, this is what you're capable of. I think the videos might have been Messi spinning Boateng yeah. in the Champions League, given <laughs> yeah. what Dessers did on the pitch against look, Betis. Look, look, but... you just do this, do this. <laughs> <laughs> or old R9 <laughs> videos, I think. But yeah, it's. Uh, I think those are the tangible differences he's made. It's um, it's yeah, uh, Dujon Sterling really cutting the mustard at Rangers right now. Um, <laughs> it wasn't a, it wasn't a classic final, Laura though. Um, it's a miserable final. Let's, <laughs> but <laughs> I won't go all Derek Adams on us right now. But it just wasn't a, wasn't a great game, shall we say? And if I was a punter, uh, anyway, Laura, Barry Robson has been under fire regularly throughout the season genuinely a performance that you would have expected more out of she's gone where have I gone she's now no, just, just a logo is... Laura <laughs> is now just a logo show. we should keep this in oh no, yeah that was amazing there we go she's back <laughs> sorry she's back. I didn't mean that she was just doing her hair uh, just a bit of surreptitious promoing of the, <laughs> the show in between <laughs> questions bang <laughs> uh, but Barry Robson, Laura, under under a lot of fire throughout the season, a poor performance again. When they had just an excellent one, um, beating Frankfurt in the Europa Conference, comes out with some interesting comments. What do you make of it all? Yeah, so he said after the game, let me just find the exact quote. We have no right as Aberdeen to come down here and run the whole game. That's a proper team we're playing against. What was the question though? Do we do we know what the question was? Because that that makes that does add a little bit of context context to the answer. Does it does it add context though? Because you should be smarter than that to know that that's the line that people are going to pull out. Regardless, people want sound bites. People want just little snippets. Yeah, and if you say yeah. something that daft, I get like I get what he's trying to say, and I completely understand. Rangers were the favourites. They are a bigger side. In general, they are making a journey down to what uh, what the SFA essentially made home territory for Rangers, considering everything that happened with the tickets and the, the home end and all sorts. But you don't come out and say something like that. I'm sorry, but that's it's quite disrespectful to his own players and his own fan base. To If you're going to go with that mindset of, we have no right to run this game, why did you turn up? I'm sorry, it's a cup final. It's 90 minutes. It is, you've got as much right as Rangers to turn up and boss that game. And if that is your mentality after the game, what was your mentality before it? 
Well, I have to I have to say, like, I genuinely do not know what the question was. So, I, and I think that's important because, really, if you take it for what it's worth, Aberdeen shouldn't go and boss against Rangers. I don't think they lost. I don't think they lost Rangers. Team. But I don't. Yeah, but like, no, the, but the I, term I understand. proper team, like Aberdeen, just beat Frankfurt two 0 the team that just got to the Europa League final two seasons ago, and they bossed them. And also to keep Three it in days context, beforehand. was that a proper team? It, was Aberdeen a proper team that night? <laughs> to keep it in context as well, Aberdeen have also taken four points off Rangers in the league so far this season. <laughs> yeah, so it's not including like only a couple of weeks in, ago as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. But again, those weren't dominant performances; they were just effective ones. Did they so not that's, win three one the at Ibrox? They won three one again. At Ibrox. Again, they didn't dominate that game. The scoreline <laughs> may, may be dominant. No, the scoreline may be dominant, but it doesn't mean your performance level is dominant. It doesn't mean they went to Rangers goals and at had... Ibrox, you're going to be quite... Well, yeah, they... let, let me just pull up the stats then. Hold on. <laughs> no, because that's important. Oh, Andrew with his miniskirt. <laughs> no, but watching that game, it was... It, Rangers should have been... In the, in the game at Ibrox under Beal, Rangers should have been out of sight, I think, but they just didn't take their chances. So when Aberdeen did get the chance to... Then they grew in confidence as the game went on. Then when they had their period of, as as always happens in football, there'll always be little pockets, even if you're the smaller team where yeah, you get no, the chance sorry. to do it. They took their Come chances on. and did no, that. Rangers, Rangers at Ibrox, when Aberdeen won 3-1, Rangers had 71% possession. They had 18 shots to Aberdeen's 14. So Aberdeen had 29% possession. They still won 3-1. So the whole idea that, you know, they didn't go to Ibrox and were a... A proper team. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So the, the 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 fact of the matter is, Rangers should have totally won that game. If anything, Rangers should have won four 0 in the grand scheme of things with the money that spent compared to what Aberdeen spent. No, so it's no, all, it's a. I, think it's no, I, I, I don't think I don't. I think that's I'm not. A, I'm not. I'm not totally out there to defend Barry Robson's comments, but I don't. I I, I kind of go back to the whole idea. Of what was the question? And someone on Twitter will tell me. I do, I do I, feel I, I, like I, that I do understand where he's coming from. I just think that, and he's not the only one this weekend for a manager to come out and just say for sure, something yeah. that's a wee bit inappropriate and not really think through his words um, very carefully. Maybe a little bit ill-advised or he's just a wee bit heated in the moment. Um, I think we've kind of seen that across the weekend. Uh, yeah. Just take a breath and think about what you're saying, I think, and just word it slightly better. Rangers have got more to look forward to. Not only will they be playing Celtic um, with the chance to go top of the league, potentially. Fine, potentially. But they, but they they also have European, the only Scottish team to look forward to European football after Christmas. They do. And it's it's a massive thing, not just to get through the group, because I think that the, the aim is always to get through the group. I think they've done it the last number of seasons when they've played in the Europa League. So to not do it, especially given the opposition that's probably not the strongest group they've ever had um, would have been a regression. But to get through the group and top it means that they actually skip the round of 32 with Champions yeah. League teams dropping in. Um, so I, th I, th I think it might even be as late as March that Rangers enter the competition again. So mm -hmm. it's it's yeah. two big matches less to play in February. And it's just that even then at that stage in the season could be a good thing. To go to Spain and beat Betis given the injuries that they had to start with and the team that they put out. But in the context of Betis had only conceded three goals at home in the league all season, nobody, uh, I think they'd been in a 15 game winning run at home mm -hmm, that was right. only ended the weekend before by Real Madrid who got a draw. So to go there and score three goals and put in the performance that they did was just, it was magnificent. Like, it, it, I, But it was across the board for Scottish clubs. First time in our history as a nation, we've had three teams yep. win group stage matches all in the same match day. Um, and that was against, you know, Feyenoord, Eintracht Frankfurt, who were beat Rangers. They just smashed U Bayern Europa Munich as well. Five and beat Bayern Munich 5-0 at the weekend. <laughs> and, and Real Betis, who are a top La Liga side. So I... I that was so encouraging, not just from a Rangers point of view, but a Scottish football point of view and a coefficient point of view to notch a couple more points on, on that as well. It's been a good week. It's been a good... <laughs> Says the happy Rangers fan. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a really good week for you, Finn. Uh, let's just wrap up the, the, the rest of the SPFL because it was, a well, two weeks in a row that Celtic have lost a league match. It was 2-0 to Hearts. Lauren Shankland and... Um, 
a smashing free kick from uh, who was it again? Kingsley. Kingsley, yeah. What a free kick it was. It was kind of reminiscent to Lee Griffiths against Joe Hart all over again. It was very, that's, very similar, wasn't it? That's exactly what it made me think of. I can't believe nobody else picked up on that online because yeah. I was like, when I saw him shaping up, it was like the position of the ball, the swear. The distance <laughs> as well. Yeah, the way that hearts, it was even the same angle of the pitch, like the same way that the camera's facing down the pitch and everything is hammed. And <laughs> that's what it put me in mind of. It's a stunning strike because some people have gone off at heart about, oh, I should be getting over to that. I'd be like, how? It's like the one pocket of the goal in between the post and the keeper's hand that he has to hit at that pace, get it up and over. It's a fantastic goal. Yeah, it's amazing, really, because also I know hearts, that, that was two defeats in a row. And then and then they've won again. But I think if you look at Hearts over the last well couple of weeks, it was four straight. Uh, was it? Oh, sorry, it was four straight wins, and then it was two defeats, uh, and then they've just they've just won again. So like the consistency is kind of there again for Hearts under Stephen Naismith. So um, good times for the Jambos at the moment. Uh, Dundee were one uh, 0 winners away to Ross County, which uh, bore the most interesting. <laughs> and probably stupidest comments I've ever heard for a long time from Derek Adams, <laughs> who's just came back into Scottish football and his third stint at Ross County. Um, he loses uh, 1-0 and he comes out and says, well, Laura, tell me, tell me what he says. Oh, these, these are good. These are, let me read you a little uh, story. <laughs> he he says, oh, the, the lines in this are incredible. He says, the standard is shocking. It's one of the worst games I've ever seen. I've been back here and see the standard and think, whoa, any chance? If I'm a spectator and watching that today, I'm thinking, is this what Scottish football is about? It needs to up its game. If this is the best product in this division, it has to be a lot better. I've left a team in League Two that's miles better than this team. Miles. And that's saying something. We had the bottom but the bottom team budget in League Two in England, and we're a hundred times better than this. One hundred times. I mean, uh, listen, I I just um, I I directed Gillingham against Bradford on Saturday. Let me tell you right now, that was one of the worst. Even though there was two goals <laughs> in that game, that was one of the worst games I have ever seen. Um, and I have watched many football matches in my time. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's just absolutely bonkers. Like, I don't know where he's coming from. I genuinely think he's on thin ice. I don't think someone like that, uh, well, uh, someone like that. No, it's, but, the, the problem uh, is I don't think a team like Ross County would take that seriously and say, you're damning our game, you're damning our reputation, because that is exactly what he's doing. Now, I, look, Again, it's a manager that's saying something from the heart. He's very emotional after a very late defeat. Um, and he's not thought through his words. I can kind of see what he's trying to say. And that is something you see behind the scenes. You say it to your coaches if you're not happy about the standard. You say it to your internal team at the club. And how do we market our, our game? How do we market our club better um, when we've got these defeats happening when they shouldn't be. Like, I get all that. These are conversations that clubs will have deep down, well behind the scenes, away from the microphones. But to come out and say that after a last minute defeat, for your players to hear that and your fans to hear that, at a time like this when fans are going out and spending their hard earned money and sitting in the cold in Dingwall watching games, you need to motivate these people. And to come out and say, nah, the game's shit. <laughs> well, it's the, 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 whole, the, whole, the whole point of like, you know, there's there's honesty and there's stupidity, and mm -hmm. you can't just you can't string them to the, them them both side by side the whole way through. You know, you can say it was a poor game, but to say it's the worst game he's ever seen. I mean, he's he's managed Ross County in the lower levels, right? You know, he he's definitely seen worst worst football games, so he's at it. So then you have to then you have to really break down into what what are his motives? He's came back. He knows. He knows how how strict he has to work with, you know. He knows he knows what what he's coming back to. So to turn around and basically say his players aren't working hard enough, B are they even good enough? Because he's certainly saying they wouldn't. None of them would get in his Markham side. Well, why didn't he stay at Markham? I I think it's interesting that I I think to be heard maybe in the lower leagues in England. 
or in in football at all, maybe in the UK, you have to be incredibly hyperbolic. You have to go be exaggerate things to a point where they're almost ridiculous for you to be heard in what you're saying. And looking at that, it's like there's a way of saying like I've I've actually been surprised at how poor the standards been since I've got back here. I thought Scottish football was better than this, as opposed to being my team was miles better than this emphasis on miles my team had the worst budget in the league and we were 100 times better than this 100 times it's all just very talk sport and yeah, i'm just like yeah, it, it yeah, doesn't yeah, it doesn't do it. there's a way of making your point without coming across as being silly when you're trying to make it but maybe that's the way he feels that he's heard there was a really interesting tweet i'll just finish on this the uh, Rory Loy, who does quite a lot of stuff with um, sports and stuff now, put out Nailed where he'd it. said some something al along the lines of Derek Adams being in England uh, and is kind of brainwashed by the opinion that bang average League One and League Two players who can't control the ball, um, saying Scottish football <laughs> is poor. He played in in League One for a team that finished eight, and he said that while they're good athletes, they are very limited ability. And he, then he ends with the great line, which makes total sense this week. No clubs in, in League One and League Two in England would be beating clubs like Frankfurt, Feyenoord and Betis. That's for yeah. sure. So I think it kind of underlines the point. Look, we know our game's not the best in the world, but is, is Dun Ross County versus Dundee the worst game of football he's ever seen? I doubt it. To be fair, Rory Law has played against me, so um, he's, he's certainly <laughs> seen ballers. Uh, you know, shite. Day. He knows shit when he sees it. <laughs> um, elsewhere, Livingston got a probably a, a, a decent point for them at home against Kilmarnock. St. Johnston got a good win against Hibs because Hibs have been doing really well recently. Uh, the Craig Levine uh, hype train continues. And St. Mirren, another nil-nil draw in Motherwell. So what's that? That is three goals. <laughs> Sorry, four goals in the Scottish Premiership. Top flight. <laughs> Pay your money, guys. <laughs> The, the thing is, yeah, though, I, 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 so uh, there was exactly also drama. That's what it's all about. There was also Liam Kelly saved a penalty again for Motherwell in the St. Mirren well game. Said, so, then. Although, the, although they're nil nil games, I think and Levy hit a penalty and, off the, po the post as well. So there's drama, exactly. Everywhere. There is drama, and it's to, to say that a nil nil game is boring just on the face of it, I think, is maybe doing it a bit of a disservice because you can get great nil-nil games that are uh, uh, really involved and everything. So I don't think it was without drama, but yeah, I get your point. One one goal across the other. Like I said, I did Gillingham Bradford at the weekend and that was 2-0 and that was pretty dull. Uh, going down to the, the lower leagues, um, Finn, do you want to rattle through what's been happening down there? Yeah, well, I, I guess the, the, the best place to start is in the top of the championship because it was a top of the table clash between Wraith and Dundee United oh, with, so uh, with Rovers going up there. It was a brilliant game. So Wraith, Wraith take it 1-0. But actually, the bit that I uh, saw from the highlights online, I was just like, that is unbelievable. Right at the death, Dundee United on the break, searching for the equaliser. Um, and uh, uh, name escapes me, I can't remember. The uh, Wraith Central defender comes in with, I think, one of the best tackles I've seen all season. Flying at man. speed. <laughs> takes the man, but fairly. T totally takes the ball first. Like There's no question that it's it's a good tackle. Absolutely cleans the boy out, takes the ball and everything. And uh, it's a match-saving tackle. Like That keeps the mm -hmm. three points, I'm sure, for Wraith Rovers. Um, and they're just, they've gone from strength to strength this season. I, I, I would say a, a surprise package to me Ooh. This season in the championship, especially <laughs> given the strength of Dundee United, and you talked about how strong Dundee United are, but um, yeah, it's making it so interesting at the top there. Um, just going quickly down the leagues as well. League One, Cove lost their first game in eleven. They've been on a pretty good run. Uh, Open the scoring against Aloha, but a late Scott target goal kind of secured away sides uh, come back. Uh, they're still sitting third in the table though, um, and. Uh, more misery for Clyde, a team that we focused on with that big chat a couple of weeks ago. Um, losing again this time to one at Peterhead. Peterhead towards the right end of the table. Stenny still doing Stenny things, uh, winning their seventh <laughs> game uh, on the bounce. They beat East 5-2-1. Uh, they stay top of the table. They're five points clear of Peter Heed. So, yeah, I'd, oh, Matt, I'd said it last week. I love this part of the season because there's so much football going on and you're really starting to see the runners and riders at both ends of the table. Just absolutely love it. I Inject it into my veins. I cannot believe you didn't pick up on Queen of the South's 
three one <laughs> victory over Edinburgh City, by the way, which is their fourteenth win against Edinburgh City. Every match has has been a win. So fourteen matches against Edinburgh City, fourteen wins. And might I add, it's about seventeen goals in the last four Queen of the South matches, which makes them the most entertaining team in League One. So there you go. <laughs> I don't have stats that say any other team has got many many goals in there, so I'm just going to say we're the best to watch. And we are currently seventh in the table. Come on, Queens. (laughs) What can I say? But that is it. That is us for another week. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks so much for Hearts Club Dr. Uh, Michael Campbell joining us on the podcast this week. And uh, thanks to you, Laura and Finn. Superb, as always. Uh, What are you doing for Christmas this year, Laura? I'm going home and I'm going to... Nobody cares! Finn, what are you doing? (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. No, what are you doing? Sorry, I cut you off. (laughs) I'm I'm going to go home and I'm going to go to a couple of games. Oh, superb. A couple of games. Football matches, I presume. (laughs) Uh, Finn? I'm jealous. Uh, I'll be working at football matches and interspersing that with trips to the beach. Oh, Oh, (laughs) all right. Jesus, come on. (laughs) Rubbing in our faces. Well, if you're still listening to our thinking about Finn in trunks right now, you really need to... (laughs) Thanks so much for listening. Go and listen to something else now. Go away. Bye.